presented by the Yamaha DXR Series. Hey, I'm John Bollinger with Premier Guitar. Today we're in Franklin, Tennessee at Artisan Guitars. I'm here with yeah. Tommy Emanuel. Alrighty, John, Be good to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for, thanks for coming all the way from the West Coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks so much for joining us today. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, uh, tone's really in the hands, but you've got a few other things you use too. Do you mind just telling us about your whole rig, well, how you do yeah, it live? Actually, people often ask me about what equipment I use, and, and they're usually disappointed when they find out how little I use. Because <laughs> yeah. I'm one of these guys that like, all I want is one good sound. I'm not looking for a variety of sounds. Right. I can get that from the instrument without pedals and effects, you know. You can get it from the guitar and from the way you play, you know. Like uh, uh, in the middle of a song, I may want the bass to get softer. I just do it with my, with my hands, you know. And then when I, when I want the, the mid-range to punch out, I do that with my hands as well, Yeah, you know. Um, but uh, so I'll just go through what I use. Sure. Uh, we're here at Artisan Guitars, and I borrowed some uh, e equipment here. But my my uh, my sound that, that 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 people hear at my concerts is um, well, it's me, but it's also my sound man, Steve Law, who who really does an amazing job. He when I plug into a PA uh, using the equipment that I use with everything set flat, you know, with no EQ on the PA, it already sounds good. You know what I mean? So it's, yeah. it's all upwards from there. It's, it, right. You know? So Steve really knows how to make the most of, of uh, uh, using the PA the right way, getting all the, the bigness and the, and the, the richness and the, the, the woodiness of the guitar out the PA, all right? So I come out of this Maiden guitar. This, this is an EBG 808 made by the Maiden Guitar Company in Melbourne, Australia. How long have you had this particular This one was made in 2008 wow. by Andy Allen at the Custom Shop. Hello, Andy. <laughs> and um, I have a few of these. Uh, normally, uh, the reason I don't have them here today is they're with Steve, my tour manager. Um, but I normally have two 808s. The other one is identical to this, cut from the same tree. Oh, wow. Yeah. Um, and uh, uh, it's a slightly orangey color. So this one I call the yellow mouse because it has a, has a yellow cut. The other one's the orange mouse. And um, so uh, the other one I, I use with a drop D tuning and, and sometimes with a drop G. I, I don't mess with the tuning on this guitar. I don't do any messing around with it and changing it and stuff. So that's always in standard. It's always in standard and I, I, I'm, always checking the tuning and always making sure that it settles. You does know? it drift much when you're playing live or does it pretty much not, just hunger Not in? normally, because I'm, I change the strings every show, right? no. about 40 minutes before the show. Well, what kind of strings do you use? These are Martin FX. They're a, they're a new um, uh, flexible core string, mm. phosphor bronze, and man, they sound amazing. Really? And what, what gauge is it? These, are, these ones are 12 to 54, so oh. it's a light gauge. But you still, you bend those and... and oh, uh, well, I'm yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Bend it a lot, yeah. you know? Um, in, in my arrangement of uh, Mona Lisa, which is... There's a double string. Wow. There's a double string bend where I bend the third as well. So you... Strong okay. hands. Yeah, you've got to gotta have strong hands to bend that, that kind of tension and to get it accurate, you know? Right. Yeah, so uh, on the, uh, the third guitar that I use is a dreadnought. It's a, a model of mine called a, a TE1. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's like a normal dreadnought size guitar, but with a kind of smooth cutaway. Uh, and th that one's an Indian rosewood with a spruce top. Oh. And that one I use bigger strings and I use medium strings, 13 to 56. And I tune it down a whole step. Um, in England or Australia, we would say it's tuned down a tone. Hmm. But here in America, they say a whole step. step. So you go. And uh, we are in America right now, so we've so, got to respect the local culture. Right, separated by a common language. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Je the important thing is, is that people out there understand what we're talking about. Yeah. Uh, yeah so the guitar is tuned down a whole step, um, and because of that fact, you can play certain shapes and and fool people into thinking you're using 
like a, a, a C tuning or a, 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 an open tuning or a dad gad or something like that. But I still just play it in normal tuning. Really? It's just tuned down. But because it's tuned down, it makes me think and feel and play in a, in a different way. Right. And cr try to create space, you know? Like when I'm playing tunes um, uh, that I've written that are, uh, that were written with the guitar tuned down, you know, if you play them with normal tuning, I'll give you an example. Here's a little bit of uh, a song I wrote called Questions. So, um, uh, where the verse goes. So there's the, 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 the melody's like a singer and then the chords follow along kind of thing. Yeah. When you play that in the lower pitch, it just sounds that much more soulful, hmm. you know? And I just love that, that sound. So that's why um, there are two reasons why I carry two of these. Is if I break a string on this guitar, which happens maybe once a year, if I break a string, sure. then I can just swap to the other guitar and someone can re-string the other guitar for me. So I've always got a spare, yeah. but I always have that other guitar in the other tuning, so I'm not messing around right. tuning on stage. Yeah. Okay. Now, did you, um, the other guitar that's tuned down a full step, did you have to do anything with the intonation or did it just hunker right in? No, it just was, wow. it's just perfect the way wow. it is. How great. Yeah, well, the, the one, the predecessor to the one I'm using right now, which is the guitar that... For those people who have kind of followed what I've been doing, uh, the one that's really scratched up all the way along here, sure. right? Um, that's that guitar I used to use down a step and a half. Wow. So, so the the E was C sharp, so it's even lower. Yeah. But I had to find strings that went from thirteen to sixty to get that real right. low piano uh, overtones coming from the deep strings. And I loved it, you know, but I wore that guitar out, you know. I literally, I was on tour in Italy about five years ago and I was doing this thing where I was creating wind and thunder with the thing and my finger went right through the face. <laughs> my finger literally went right through the face because it had worn down and it was, right. it was paper thin, you know. <laughs> you know? And so, <laughs> so what, I, what I did is I... I, I, I took it to a, a, a place in Verona called the Musical Box and my friend Roberto Fontenot put little slivers of birch, really good solid wood, oh. up here until he matched the top and really? gave me back the guitar and it played again just fine. Wow. You know? How did, did it sound quite a bit different? Or it uh... sounded exactly the same. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's a, that's a funny thing. People think that uh, all this stuff that I do to my guitar is really altering the sound and it, it doesn't. The day that I got this guitar, the, the, the first gig that I did with this particular <laughs> guitar, uh, it arrived on the, on the plane and we were in Santa Cruz, California. And I took the guitar out and put it on the stand and I was going to play my new guitar, you know. And um, my tour manager said, there's a hole in that guitar. And I said, where? What are you talking about? It was cracked <laughs> from here to here, like that. And this was laying open. You could put oh, your fingers no. in there. Yeah. So I just grabbed it and squeezed it together and we taped it with gaff tape like that and like that. And I played the show with the guitar gaff together and it sounded fine. Get a little gaff tape on it right now, in fact. Oh yeah. That would, that's, <laughs> see, this is, on, this is on the road re, re, repairs. Uh, yeah. I had the microphone here rewired uh, because I, got, I developed a little hum yeah. And w when you're playing a guitar with the mic wide open into this big, beautiful PA in a 2,000-seater hall, you're going to hear every minute detail right. of everything, including any electronic faults, right? Uh, so we, dis we discovered there was a little hum. So what we did is we, we, we had the wiring rewired and then all grounded and then wrapped in this kind of rubber thing, which was perfect. Now we've got no... 
hums in his head, but now the mic is in a slightly different position. And me being the, uh, the uh, here's the sound I'm looking for, how am I going to get it? What I did is I, I pushed it back and then I gaffed it in place and I got the sound. So kids, always carry gaff tape at your gigs. Yes. You never know. Yeah, exactly. Wow. Anyway, um, uh, so <laughs> I have these three, three guitars. We're, we're getting there first. Uh, and then I, I come out of the, the guitar into a tuner. And this is what I use on stage. It's a little, little boss, boss chromatic TV. tuner. I mean, everybody's got these things and they're, they're, um, they're as good as it gets on stage. Yeah. You know, Be, the reason I like it is because it's simple. When the light is red, that's bad. <laughs> right. that's, I'm out of tune. Yeah. When it's green, everything's good. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, I don't need to know that uh, my G string is spinning at 432 cycles per second right. and all that. I don't need to know any of that stuff. I need to know I'm in tune. So, right. so keep it simple on stage. You can use those uh, tuners that, like Peterson tuners and yeah. all that stuff. They're, they're fine off stage. On stage, they're so hard to read, right. I, I find. Especially, I mean, I, I, it's just me up there, so I, I, I can't, you know, disappear into the band and let someone else take it. There right. is no band. I am the band. So, so everything's got to be organized and, and easy for me. So I come out of the tuner. And you just run that on batteries? Just uh... No, no, it's run on power. Okay. Yeah. Uh, although I keep a fresh battery in it. If anything happens with the power, I sure. can just... Pl unplug it. So then I go out of the tuner. The, the, the tuner, by the way, is a mute. And uh, so am I sometimes. But um, <laughs> um, yeah, it, it, it's a mute. So I just tread on it, unplug my guitar. There's no sound. People don't hear a sound. I switch guitars and I'm still talking to the audience, plug in, make sure everything's working. And then I just hit the tuner and play the song. And then everything's so quiet, you know. So, and then I go into this little uh, device here called a colorizer made by AER, which is a, a great German company. And basically this is, this is like a, a preamp um, and, and that signal goes straight into the PA. So this is, this is the first signal that, that, that you hear. And it, it's a big fat signal, right? And it's real clean. Um, and is there any reverb or anything like that on that? No, or just this a, is no reverb here. Just a preamp. I don't, I'm using a bit of reverb on the amp today mm. because I'm, I'm sitting here without, you know, a PA and uh, sure. everything. But um, I don't use effects on stage. I, I used to, but now I have a, such a good sound man uh, that um, he does all my delays and reverbs and stereo panning and stuff. He does all that out the front. Hmm. I just get, I just give him the two biggest, cleanest signals that I can, and he puts them in, in the PA. I can change stuff if I want. I can turn up. If yeah. I want to turn up, I can just turn up here or turn up on the amp or, or, or whatever. But normally, I don't have to touch anything. I just have to play and be in tune. You right. know? So I, I go through the colorizer. I come out of the colorizer on a bypass and go into the amp. The amp is a... Uh, uh, an AER Compact 60, which is a 60 watt amp, and I'm using it barely on. Yeah, my settings are the master on about nine o'clock, and the the channel on about nine o'clock. Mm -hmm. So it's like three and three. That kind of and is that your only stage monitor? Do you have it? I know I have two monitors in front, oh, okay. and the front ones have a, some guitar and my voice like that, like a. The, the real front on, on the sound of my voice and the sound of the guitar. And behind me are two more monitors and he's, he pumps a little bass into them. So I have like a, a bit of a wall of sound behind yeah. me as well as the front on the note for accuracy and stuff, you know? That's got to just sound great on stage. Oh, it's amazing. Do you prefer yeah. to play on stage plugged in or like alone in a room uh, uh, well, with nothing plugged in? in? What I miss, see, th these days, all theatres have what we call line array PAs. And line array PAs are amazing for the audience and they're no good at all for the artist on stage. What is a line array PA? A line array, it, it, fl it flies like that, it's like oh, a yeah. curve. And all the sound goes out front, right? Yeah. There's nothing behind. Right. You wouldn't even know it was on. And you walk in front of it and it's going bang, right? Yeah. For an, for an artist like me who's grown up in, in rock and roll music, 
and, and you play to the sound that you're hearing in the PA, the punch of the PA, and it's not there anymore. Because it is there, you just can't hear it. Yeah. So you have to compensate for that. It was difficult in the early days when they first started using line array PAs. I had to get used to the fact that my sound was big out there, but it was just small up here. And it was, it, 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 it's a, it's a frustrating feeling sure. because you, you, want to, you want to be able to play less and have it mean more, you know, and, and you end up trying too hard. And I found that I was doing that and I, and I had to really make a compromise, play a bit louder on stage and try to uh, make sure that, that I wasn't overcompensating. And what I did is when, when Steve Law started working for me, um, every couple of days I would get on YouTube and have a look at whatever someone has loaded up the day before or whatever. And it's usually from the concert from last night. Right. So I can hear from the audience perspective what I sounded like. So I put headphones on, plug into my little computer and have a listen from the audience perspective. And it's always amazing. The sound he gets is huh. incredible. That's and great. I, yeah, well, I have to do that. You yeah. Know? Well, you know, it's, it's so interesting because artists rarely know what they sound like out front because you're, you're never well, there. To me, it's everything. Yeah. That, that's why in the early days when I was working with, with uh, whatever sound man was available at, at the venue, yeah. nine out of ten of them thought that I didn't care about what went on out the front. And they really uh, underestimated my, my, my uh, ability in, in sound. And yeah. I... I would say, uh, turn the bass up a little more. Okay, turn the PA up a little more. Now, leave it there and don't touch it. If you do touch it, I will come out there and kill you, <laughs> you know? And, 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 and you know, guys, some sound guys can't help themselves. They've got to be twiddling all the time. Yeah. And it's like the, the real good sound guys, they get the sound and then they go and they listen, yeah. you know? And if anything needs doing, they'll, they'll do it. But other than that, they don't sit there going, yeah. <laughs> so basically, uh, my setup and the way I, I run my concerts is a really, it's teamwork with my sound man. Once, once my sound is how I like it, yeah, I, I feel like I can do anything. Yeah. And you, I mean, you, you, uh, you're playing it so full of nuance and subtlety that, I mean, you could, it'd be really easy to lose that with the... Um... Exactly. And that's the thing that Steve is is so um, um, sensitive to all that stuff. Mm -hmm. and, and that's another thing that I check on when I, when I, I have a look at a, at a video from a, from a concert the night before or whatever. I'm listening for all the detail yeah. and it's all there. You know? and, and my hearing is not good. I was born with yellow fever. So my hearing was burned out before I came into the world. Really? Yeah, but I can hear, I can hear guitar better than anything. You know, like... Other instruments uh, I, I can hear, but I have trouble hearing voices. Uh, only when I drink, then I start hearing voices. <laughs> no. uh, and then, uh, um, so I try to I try to play and compensate uh, detail with with my own hands. You mm -hmm. know, if I'm playing, say if I'm playing a ballad where I want to get the melody to come out nicely, uh, I'll and, and I'm going to play softly. I'll I'll then. Uh, What, what, what I've done to get that clarity there is before I played this slow ballad, I back the bass down a little bit and give myself a little mid-range. So then I, if I, I don't have to play uh, harder to get the melody to come out. I actually play the bass softer and let, let the melody speak hmm. kind of thing. So like a...
Great. So it's all there, you know? And you're, and it's just the proprietary uh, pickup system that comes yeah. with the Mountain Guitars. What you're hearing is the pickup and the microphone. And I'm, I, I cover the hole here. I'm using like a rubber plug called a Feedback Buster. And basically, if you want to get as much microphone and pickup into the PA, you've got to cover the hole. Sure. Right? Um, and I love playing acoustic guitar just with a mic on it. But a lot of times, it's not a practicality. Sometimes you're, when you tour as much as I do, you've got to show up, get your gear on stage, get a sound check, eat, meet people, do a show, get to the next town. Right. And that's what life's like on the road. Yeah. And you can't always have the luxury of being able to try different microphones and mess around with all that sort right. of stuff and find frequencies that are going to cause you trouble. It's you just got to go. Plug yeah. and pray. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So that's the way I do it. I also like to have the mic flat out for when I'm when I'm doing percussion stuff, you know. Yeah. All that and and uh, in the middle of tunes like 9 pound hammer, yeah. I'll go into like a bass riff and play So forth, you know. And that is so hip. In man. order, in order to get well, as soon as I got the guitar, the first thing, the first thing I did is grabbed a screwdriver and went <laughs> and scratched it all up because, see, there's a smooth surface, doesn't make any sound, but here where it's rough, oh, I can get that you know, cool. brush and thing, and then I just play the bass. And... So. On your uh, on your signature model, do they come pre-scratched? No. Or do you have to do that? Your uh, <laughs> no, we often thought about that. Yeah. You, you know how Fender do those road road yeah, worn relic. instruments. Yeah. Um, we often thought about that about you know, making a guitar that's already scratched up. Yeah. But then I don't know. There's something much more soulful about you scratching your right. own instrument up yeah. and making it because I do have lots of guitars like these beautiful guitars here that don't have a mark on them because there's no reason to, you know. Right. This, th this, this guitar is my workhorse on the road, you know, and I need it to with withstand what I'm doing and to deliver all the sounds I'm after. Yeah. So, you know, you're, and you're, you're, uh, your left foot's a real percussive part of your playing. Does that, do you, do you, does your vocal mic pick that up or anything like that when you're playing? Like no, your foot it's just stomping? in the room. I'm just banging away on my foot. Because you hear it. I mean, the oh, audience yeah, hears it. And it's... In fact, I had a lady one, one time at a concert came up to me at the interval and because uh, I'd walked outside to get some fresh air yeah. and she spotted me and she came running up and she was quite perturbed. You know, she was quite agitated and she said, I didn't come here to hear you tap your foot. I came here to hear you play the guitar. And I said... What, what, do you want me to stop tapping my foot? She said, if you could, please. <laughs> and I said, lady, I can't play. If I stop my foot, everything stops. Yeah, right. you know, she was complaining. So what I did to, to please the old bag is, uh, <laughs> uh, what I did is I took my shoe off and played in my socks, really? you know. See, that's a cool part the of it. The customer is always yeah. Right. Customers are good for you. Now, well, and it was fun, and then it became part of my show. Which socks am I going to wear tonight? <laughs> yeah. But it, you know, it's true that you to feel time and to make music feel good, it has to come from your body yeah. and your mind and your hands. You yeah. know, it comes from everywhere. You know, and when I'm stating where the groove is, um, you, you should have no question about where where it is yeah yeah it's did you you must have like worked with the metronome all the time as a I, kid. I still do in fact uh see this this is my tuner that i i, I tune with yeah. backstage and all that so and it's just a little cog tuner but look at this to, yeah it's a metronome and i i work with this baby there you go there you go Oh yeah, I'll 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 do some. And I I practice in in double time and half time and everything with the with the, with 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 the uh, click. Um, and the only time I any time I don't play two and four with my or one and three with my foot is uh, when I'm playing a song where I need. Uh, it to feel like it falls on the three. Like what I mean is this. So uh, it, there's a song of mine called Drive Time. And um, uh, 
The song, if I was playing drums in it, I would play the bass drum here. One, two, three, four. So one, two, and three. And one, two, and three, and four. One, two, and three. And I'd play the bass drum on three. So when I play the song... Yeah. I'm feeling it that way, right? But I could also go... Uh, uh. We never get enough drive time Stop now. If you're doing all those crazy chord clusters, do you know what those actual chords are? They're just... Oh, absolutely, I know what they are. They're that one and that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I'm going for a certain sound, and yeah. in order to get it like a... Right, you either do yeah. it that way. Yeah. But I've worked out a way of... Because I've used my thumb all my life, yeah. I get to shape quickly uh, and get all that... You know, and yeah. let, let the melody ring, right? Right. So I, my mind is on getting the melody to feel great, and then I put the, all the rest of the stuff around it. Then I practice it up so my hands know what to do, but then my mind stays with the, with the melody, right? Yeah. So all the, all like, like the housework of, of being able to make your hand go like that. And m most people would struggle with that because yeah. I'm going... Right. Right? The Richie Haywood... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. right. So... Yeah. There's a normal shape, right? Yeah. And then... Right. It's, it's really baffling to watch because it yeah. never looks conventional. It's all wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Tell me, you play all but, wrong. But it works. That's what it, that's what it takes to, to play a lot of these songs. And I write because I can play that way. Yeah. You know? But melodically, it all works. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Know? It's brilliant. And, and, uh, and I'm going for a certain sound. With, with this song, you know, and I wrote Drive Time because um, I was I was messing around finding a way of going Right? Yeah. The typical kind of R&B move. Sure. And so uh, the, the actual riff starts on one, two, three, four. So I started out with that that little idea. Yeah. And I thought, well, that, that, that's really nice. But now, wh what are we going to say? What story are we going to tell? You know. Da, 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 da. And they're, they're, they're Chet Atkins shapes. Yeah. I, I bet you I wouldn't have written that if I hadn't totally listened to James Taylor since I was a teenager. Because you can hear him in everything I'm doing. And it's not his guitar playing, it's his writing and his singing that right. you can hear in my, in my playing. Yeah, he's just, he just happens to play guitar. He's an amazing oh, musician. Boy, who just, I love his guitar yeah. playing. But that, um, um, the, the influence uh, uh, that he's had on me, uh, along with Gordon Lightfoot and, and people like that, 
has been an invaluable thing that I've drawn on a lot, you know. Sure. But you know, my whatever my abilities are, I'm I try to use what I have to 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 get to tell the story that I'm trying to tell right. with the songs I write. Yeah, that's that's that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, totally. Okay. Hey, no, just just to, um, a few more details. What mm. you switch between uh, a flat pick and a, and thumb, a thumb pick? pick. Yeah. What what uh, what do you use? What kind of? Picks? Well, the the picks I'm using at the moment were given to me by the great David Grisman. And, oh, uh, cool. and Martin Taylor turned, turned me on to these because Martin uses the same pick. It's called a dog pick. And uh, uh, I think they're made here in America. Uh, it's, a, it's a mandolin pick. It's like tortoiseshell, but of course it's not tortoiseshell. It's plastic, but it has a good, good feel to mm -hmm. it. You know? um, and I've evolved. I feel that I've evolved to this pick. You know? Really? So I started out with thin picks. Yeah. And then because they were, they made it easy to play. And then I started trying to improve what I was doing in my technique, and I realized I need a, a more, a, a stronger pick. So I got a medium, Fender medium. Then I went to a Fender heavy, then a Fender extra heavy, and then I went to, you know, um, custom made picks and stuff. And then I went to, I was using a Michelle Wigan pick for, for quite a while, and that was really good too. But I actually wore that pick out, and. Um, so I used the same pick for about 10 years. And I totally wore it down <laughs> really? to the knob. Yeah. One, you literally one, had one pick. One pick, yeah. One magic, one, <laughs> one magic pick. So now I use these because I really like them. Uh, no, I'm sorry, can I see that? Yeah, absolutely. It's a mandolin pick. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Dog, D-A-W-G? Yeah, dog. Yeah. Dog. Dog. Yo, dog. For you, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Dog. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's great. And, and the, uh, I, I've got my own brand thumb picks, which are based on these uh, Jim Dunlop picks. Hello, Jim. Jim's a great guy. Lives up in uh, Napa. I hope you weren't hurt by the earthquake. I hope that all your picks and thumb picks uh, survive the earthquake, Jimmy. Um, so, so it's a Dunlop signature? It's a Dunlop medium pick, yeah. But, um, uh, I, like a, I like a thumb pick that's, that, that's really, that, that sits nice and tight. Yeah. Um, I can't use those uh, slick pick uh, kind of plasticky ones because they, if I start to lay a groove in, it would fly across the room, right. you know? Yeah. So, um, uh, but, you know, people often say, what string do you use? What guitar do you use? What picks do you use? Blah, 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 and all that. That doesn't matter. It, what matters is what works for you. Right. You right. know, I use these things because they work for me. But... You know, other things may work for you. You know, I know people who swear by elixir strings and something else. You know, uh, some other kind of picks. So it's up, it's up to you to find what what g gives you the best feeling when you play and and what really works for you. Yeah. You know, um, and sometimes it's well. Have a look at Willie Nelson. He's used the same old Martin guitar. And, you know, it sounds like a piece of crap on stage, but out the front it sounds gorgeous. Yeah. And, and Willie plays beautifully. He has his thing, you know. And Willie wouldn't be Willie without that, right. uh, without that guitar, you know. And he's found what works for him 50 years ago. Right, right. You know? Yeah, plugged into that same weird old yeah. amp and whatever it is. And the other thing I noticed was that, I mean, the really good players... Yeah, like, like Robin Ford, for instance, I've seen him play a Strat, a Tele, a Les Paul, an a, 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 a Epiphone Casino, a 335, a, a, a Fender, a signature model. He always sounds the same. Yeah. Because that's how Robin sounds. Yeah. And I think the principle is we have a sound in our head that we're going for, and it doesn't matter what instruments and amps or configurations, we always end up getting that sound. Right. You know, Keith Urban's another classic example. Yeah. Keith has a great sound, but Keith's always had that sound. Right. He has a beautiful sound, and it doesn't matter whether he's playing a Stratotelli or um, a Paul Reed Smith or whatever, or a really expensive amp or a cheap amp or 10 different pedals, he always gets that sound. Yeah, I've heard him plugged into a, uh, a PV, I think it's like a Bandit, back in yeah. his four-wheel drive days when he had a Bandit. Oh, yeah, with, with the ranch. Right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, he's yeah. always had a good sound. Yeah. You know? And he's a Matin guy as well, right? Yeah, he is, yeah. yeah. And James Burton and Albert Lee, you know, those guys, yeah. they just, when they plug in, there's their sound. You right. Know? And, and I think that, you know, when I... 
when, when we started building this model gu guitar, that's when I really found my voice as an acoustic player. I felt that this guitar did everything for me. Right. You know? And that's somewhere between like a double lot and an OM sort yeah, of? Yeah, it's, it's, it's not the smaller parlor shape and it's not quite the OM, it's, it's in, in between. Yeah. So like a double O size. Yeah. yeah, and is that so an ebony fingerboard on that? This is a rosewood fingerboard. Oh, I like okay. rosewood. Oh yeah, yeah, R rosewood here and here. I've got um, in my guitar, Joe, my, my my good buddy Joe Glazer has put stainless steel frets oh. in this guitar, and and I like I like that because, uh, well, it's a lot harder on your hands. Really, it really is. It took. For me, I think it was like a month of having sore fingers. Really? Yeah, just getting used to the height and the feel of these stainless steel frets. But the sound uh, of the guitar everywhere on the fretboard is so even and so so nice. You know, like when I when I play um, when I play single line melody stuff with John Knowles playing the nylon string, and I don't play any kind of chordal stuff. I just bring the mid-range up on my guitar and then use the sound coming off these threads. So it doesn't matter where you go on the instrument. It's, it speaks, you know. Yeah, yeah, beautiful. Well, Tommy, I can't thank you enough for uh, joining us today oh, and, uh, and revealing the secrets that it's really all in your hands. It's That's the <laughs> secret. <laughs> So yeah. all this crap, it it's, really doesn't matter. No, it's, it's just it's up to you. You make <laughs> yeah. the sound. Yeah. Bad news, it's up to you. <laughs> no, no. The good news is there's a lot of great equipment out there, a lot of great guitars, um, and find what works for you yeah. and get to work. That, that's what really counts. Yeah, and you, I mean, you, you are the hardest working man in show business. You, <laughs> you gig all the time. Well, I'm trying to get good at it. So, and that, that's the way I know how to. Mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> not, not yet. Well, <laughs> oh, hey, would you mind uh, playing us yeah, out I'm on just, something? I'm just trying to think what I'd like to play. I think I'll, I'll uh, let me finger peck you too. <laughs> I'll talk a little bit like, uh, like that. Uh, let me play a little bit of uh, traveling clothes for you. Here you go, back.
Don't forget to sign up for PG Perks, your all-access pass to exclusive gear giveaways and discounts on PremierGuitar.com.